Good evening everyone, it's lovely to see you all. Uh, let's just come to God in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of meeting together in your house. We thank you that above all, uh, you are here because you have promised to be wherever your people gather together. And so we ask for that promise, Lord, to be fulfilled in us tonight, that you would meet with us together, but also that you would meet with us uh, as individuals. That as we read your word, as we discuss it together, as we think of it and try to understand what it, what it says, we pray that you would be our teacher and that it wouldn't just be a dry and dusty uh, exercise, Lord, in academia, but it would be a living word of God mm. and that it would change us and move us and make us think about how we uh, conduct ourselves uh, in our Christian lives. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless your word to us. It's a, uh, a literally little unknown book. That we're praying to look at tonight but this is all your word and so we pray that you would come amongst us now and bless us so we commit our time into your hands and we pray lord god you would be with us now in jesus name amen amen, amen. <coughs> amen. well this is the the seventh in the series of the book of the twelve um and there comes a break with this uh, particular book that we're looking at because as you may remember uh the book of the twelve is divided up into three uh, the first seven books are to, are written or are to do with uh, principally uh, the overrising uh, giant that is the Assyrian Empire. And uh, you'll know that by now uh, the, uh, the Assyrians have taken uh, Samaria uh, and have, are now at this moment trying to take the, uh, the land of Judah as well. Um, and as I said before, we're trying to read the book of the twelve in the in the chronicle chronological order the order in which they were written um and uh whilst there's a lot of discussion and everybody's got their own point of view i actually found someone this week who almost agreed with my chronology which was quite encouraging um he just got obadiah wrong but we can forgive him that because uh, he made the classic mistake of thinking it's part of the babylonian problem but he, he's uh, clearly wrong as we've seen and we've, we've looked at obadiah uh, uh, denounces Edom then we've looked at Joel um, and picked up uh, the phrases of Joel from uh, Obadiah gone on to Amos Amos talks about uh, God's plan to bring the Gentiles in to the, the kingdom partly because of Israel's ingratitude shown by their idolatry and then Jonah is written uh, and Jonah is written as a visual aid really as a picture to uh, Israel that if they continue in their sin God has the right, and he will exercise that right, to uh, welcome the Gentiles uh, into the kingdom. This is why Jonah is so angry, um, because he doesn't want God to show mercy on these vilest of people. The Assyrians were known to be, in their day, uh, the most vile people on earth. And show Jonah, Jonah's book shows God's grace to the worst of people. Uh, and then after Jonah comes Hosea, and Hosea furthers Amos' charge of ingratitude by declaring Israel uh, to have committed spiritual adultery. And again, he uses the type of the lawsuit uh, to bring his charges. And then there are three parts to the charge. Uh, and we had a look at that. He charges Israel with a lack of knowledge, a lack of faithfulness, a lack of loyalty, uh, pushing God out of their thinking, echoes of Romans 1. And then after Hosea comes Micah. And we said last time that Micah is God's last word to Israel, uh, the ten northern tribes. And Micah watches his prophecies come true as Samaria uh, and the north uh, are dismantled by the Assyrian army. Um, and then Micah turns his prophecies to Judah, where he is sent to. And E.J. Young, uh, the great scholar, says he's set to send forth the nature of God's complaint against his people to announce the certain punishment of sin and the sure salvation to come, which salvation will centre around the appearance of the design Messiah. And we saw last time that Micah is a, a real repetition of judgment, salvation oracles, judgment oracles, salvation oracle. Um, but in the midst of all of that, there were some real gospel gems, weren't there? You know, as well as the promise uh, of the Messiah. And then, as you've probably worked out by now, after Micah, comes the book of Nahum and there's a bit of an interval between the book of Micah and the book of Nahum and 
as things have changed. Hezekiah is long gone when Nahum is sent to write his book and Manasseh <coughs> has become king. And as you'll know, Manasseh started off being the worst king they'd ever had in terms of idolatry and wickedness uh, of all kinds. So much so that uh, Manasseh was sent off uh, to uh, Assyria by the Lord, uh, literally with a nose a hook. Uh, he was dragged off in uh, utter shame uh, and was spent some time, not quite sure how long, but uh, enough time for Manasseh to come back to God in repentance um, and this is quite interesting because, of course, it's, you'll know it's Manasseh who is traditionally thought of as the man who sawed Isaiah in two. But God restored him to his throne and he restored the worship of God to Israel. So it's coming to the end of Manasseh's reign. There's a brief two year hiatus when Ammon comes, and then after that is Josiah. So Judah are doing relatively well in terms of their spiritual uh, walk. Um, so that's, that's Judah. Israel, as we said, has been dismantled. Uh, 27,000 people uh, have been taken out of Israel and the foreigners have been brought in. And so you now have this state, really, of, of Samaria or the Samaritans. And of course, when Jesus walks the earth, the Samaritans are viewed as an almost separate country, aren't they? You know, we read that the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. They're, they're a different race. They're not part of us. Um, they just kind of happen to be right in the middle of the land because you have Judah down here, then you have Samaria, and then you have the north part, which is Galilee. So the, the, the Samaritans are now really a, a, a kind of people of their own. Assyria rules all with an iron fist. Uh, the new capital of uh, Assyria has been moved from Ashur to the city of Nineveh. And, and it's been a magnificent and incredible building project. Uh, it, ha it has to be seen to be believed. Uh, the Biblical Archaeology Review states that uh, Sennacherib, who was the man, if you remember, who came and insulted Hezekiah, his construction of a new capital at Nineveh was a massive endeavour, and the city and its garden were supplied with a water management project unparalleled at the time. Sennacherib built a, not just one canal, but a whole canal system, um, which uh, irrigated the land. At its longest, it was 50 miles long and wider than the existing Panama Canal is today. He had sluice gates, aqueducts, um, the proper uh, dress stones, waterproof cement. I mean, we think the Victorians invented, you know, the aqueduct, you know, the sluice gates and the, you know, the aqueduct. But <coughs> the Assyrians uh, had that uh, all buttoned down uh, 2,700 years uh, ago. And uh, the, the city was, was massively enlarged, and it was enlarged again under the successive kings after Sennacherib came uh, Esau Haddon, and after him came uh, a man called Ashurbanipal, who was perhaps one of the greatest kings uh, of, uh, of all. And uh, they made the city colossal. And money came in, it poured in from tribute. Every country they conquered, they made pay a very heavy tribute, uh, and they also controlled the trade routes. So all the caravans who would go from one country to another, they had to pay a toll on the way in, and that went straight to the king of Assyria. Now, Nahum writes his book. Um, it, it's always, it's a wee bit of a guess, but um, clearly after 663 BC, uh, which we'll come to later on for the reasons why that, um, and probably uh, within 10 years of that, uh, of that date, um, the, early, the latest he could have written it realistically is 630 BC because after that Ashurbanipal dies and the kingdom begins to get involved in civil war and fights. So I want to try, uh, in, and in your minds, I want you to try and set the scene for this book to be written because without a knowledge of how it was, 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 was written and, and why Nahum was sent to write it, it won't mean anything. So I want you to try and picture this city of Nineveh. So we're going to set the scene uh, of Nineveh first of all. And, and you'll know, of course, that it was originally built by Nimrod way back in Genesis 10. Uh, so it was a very ancient city, but it was a, a regional city with a kind of regional deity. And it was just one of a number of cities, a very old city, but nothing over spectacular until the Assyrians became the dominant power. And in particular, when Sennacherib began to uh, build it. And by the time Sennacherib had finished, 
um, around about the early 700s, uh, late 690s rather, uh, Nineveh was the largest fortress city that had ever been built in the world. It was the largest one that had ever been built. It was uh, around the, the circumference of the city walls around were eight miles. The wall itself was 100 feet high. And to give you some idea of that, that's kind of four houses that you would build nowadays with a pitched roof on top of each other. That was the wall. It had towers in the ramparts at regular intervals, which of course were even higher. The wall itself was wide enough for three chariots to, to, uh, to, to run across. So, you know, the width of one half of a motorway. Uh, and that was the top of the wall. Uh, so it gives you just some idea of how incredible this place was. In front of the wall was a moat, uh, as, as lots of, of fortresses had their moats in those days. But this moat uh, was 50 feet wide and 20 feet deep. Okay, so it, it's going to take a serious amount of, uh, of, of boatage to get across there. So this, this place is incredibly solid. It's incredibly vast. It's big. It looks, you know, more than impregnable. You know, for an army coming to try and take the city of Nineveh uh, would have just been impossible. There was just no way in. You, you could not possibly cross the stream in enough speed uh, to then attack the walls with enough men to kind of get in the city. And so the point of sending you all that is that when Nahum writes his prophecy against Nineveh, it seems utterly ridiculous. That's the, the context in which the book is written. So that's setting the scene physically of, Na of Nineveh, but we also need to set the scene spiritually of Nineveh, because the question is, why is Nahum given this task? In Nahum 1 verse 1, we read the burden against Nineveh. Now, the burden uh, literally translates to oracle, um, and we might call this a woe oracle, more likely a war oracle, really. It, it's, a, it's a burden, it's something heavy that he has to write. He's given a terrible message, actually, to, to give to Nineveh. And in answer to that question as to why Nahum was given this uh, task, we need to remember that Nineveh had committed two sins, which were heinous sins in the eyes of the Lord. First of all, uh, Nineveh's sin, first sin, hi Brian, we're in Nahum chapter 1, um, is that the violence and the wickedness that they had committed against the Israel, the northern states who God had appointed uh, to take away. You remember God had told um, Israel that they would come and they would be taken away as a, as a punishment. And um, Assyria had simply overstepped the mark. They had committed what we would now call war crimes, atrocities of the worst of kind. So it wasn't just that they'd conquered Israel and taken them away, which they were entitled to do under the dispensation of God, but the way that they had behaved with their typical barbarity had overstepped the mark. And God uh, makes that very clear. Uh, in, and in fact, uh, God knew that they would because Isaiah, who is before Nahum and a contemporary of Micah, as you may well remember, um, Isaiah actually... Uh, writes about this uh, in chapter 10 and verse 5 and he says woe to Assyria the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation so he was appointed by God to be the discipline rod if you like of, of Israel but then he says I will send against him an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath I will give him charge the seas to spoil to take the prey to tread them down like the mire of the streets yet he does not mean so nor does his heart think so, but is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalna like Karchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do to Jerusalem and all her idols? And so Assyria was allowed by God to take away Israel, but they overstepped the mark. They went to, uh, into, uh, into Judah, which they had no mandate uh, to do. You may well um, know from secular history that there's a relief, um, a, sort of like a, a big picture uh, carved of uh, what 
Sennacherib did to the Judean town of Lachish, uh, the, the, the wickedness and the violence uh, were, were really quite terrible. So that was their first sin. Uh, the second sin is that they are now, of course, guilty of sinning against grace. You remember Jonah's mission. When Jonah goes to Nineveh in a hundred years before this, he's preaching to a people that have never been preached to before. And he preaches, yet 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And we know that they repented. And they repented completely. That whole generation uh, repented. But some 50 years later, you'll note, you'll remember when Sennacherib comes uh, and uh, you know, walks through Lachish and does all these atrocities, comes to Jerusalem. What does he do? He blasphemes God. It's quite clear that by then, the spiritual revival of 50 years ago or so uh, has gone And so whereas Jonah preaches to those who've never heard of the Lord, Nahum uh, is tasked to speak to those who have cast him aside, cast God's grace aside. And yet, uh, as verse 1, sorry, as chapter 1 verse 3 implies, where he says the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, uh, in fact, Nineveh had far longer to repent uh, after Nahum's book than they did under Jonah. Uh, Jonah gave them 40 days. Uh, it actually was about 40 years before Nineveh uh, was um, uh, attacked. But now, these people are not interested in God anymore. Uh, they've tasted his mercy, but the generation, uh, or the generation after that have come up, uh, they're not interested. By now, the bloodlust and the idolatry and the immorality and the pride have taken hold of the Assyrians. Their reputation... Uh, is, is gone throughout the world as the most violent and barbarous people. And Nahum, in fact, calls Nineveh both a harlot and a sorceress later on in the prophecy um, because of the way that they had behaved. And as we've said already, they felt impregnable and they had already done something quite amazing. There was a city called Noamon, which we'll read of in chapter 3, secularly known as Thebes uh in uh, egypt now this was also another seemingly impregnable fortress city because it was on the nile it was built around the tributaries of the nile getting to it uh, let alone conquering it was difficult enough but the assyrians had actually taken this city and they'd uh, sacked it and they'd raided all the money uh, and they did that in 663 bc and nahum speaks about that as a past thing in chapter three uh and so God is saying to them, you know, you felt uh, impregnable, but just as that city was supposed to be impregnable, so uh, you will fail uh, as well. And you might say, well, how did did, uh, Nineveh fall? Well, history tells us that the river Tigris, uh, which is on the east side of the city, flooded, and it actually burst through the wall, uh, creating a great big chasm. And uh, being told by the spies of this, Nablo Palasa, the, uh, who would become the, the kind of the chief of the Babylonian Empire, raised an army of quite a confederate bunch of discontents, and they actually ran through the hole, got through the hole, uh, and they destroyed Nineveh. They burnt it, set it on fire, <coughs> plundered it, uh, and uh, it was not discovered again. The, 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 the plundering and the sacking was so thorough that it was not actually discovered again until 2,400 years later. In 1804, it was discovered by archaeologists. A few miles away now stands the city of Mosul, which you no doubt will have heard of in modern uh, history. So this is kind of the situation that Nahum addresses, a physically impenetrable city, uh, walls so thick and high, a uh, people so cruel and barbarous that nobody would have dared... Uh, to attack him, to to even entertain the idea would have been nonsense. They were rich, they were powerful, they controlled the world of that day. Spiritually speaking, they'd hardened their heart to God (coughs) and they had turned away from him. And so Nahum is sent to write to them. He's he's, uh, 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 this man, uh, Nathan the prophet. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, we're told the burden against uh, Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. So who is this man, Nahum? Well, interestingly, Nahum is a shortened form of Nehemiah. It means comfort or comfort of Yahweh. And um, which is a bit ironic, really, because there isn't too much comfort in the book that he writes. Uh, now, Elkosh, we, we, nobody really agrees where it is. 
Um, some say it's in the same area of Micah, southwest of Jerusalem, but there's quite a nice little story in the, the tradition of the rabbis, which says that in fact it was a, a city of what became known as the area of Galilee, uh, a village called Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum means village of Nahum. And so uh, I can't prove that to you, but if it is true, then the Lord Jesus would have walked around the same area that Nahum was raised in. So as I say, we, we can't prove that, but uh, that's quite a nice little uh, story that I've read. And each chapter is a separate division, uh, and we'll look at them uh, sort of like fairly uh, briefly uh, through, throughout tonight. And so, as we said, unless we understand both the time frame and the power of Nineveh, we won't really understand uh, the enormity of the task that befell Nahum. When he sit down to write, he's given this vision, God says, here's this vision, write it down. I don't know whether he took it to, to uh, Assyria or whether he posted it to Assyria, we're not really quite sure. But, uh, as I say, Nineveh is this uh, incredible uh, city, um, riding on the crest of an empire that's been growing for a hundred years. The biggest that there's ever been. Israel has already been conquered by them. Little dot of Judah seems completely insignificant. How do you start a message? If God says to you, I want you to write to, the, to, you know, to this empire, I want you to write to the king of this empire, you know, how, how are you going to start? Well, if you have a look at Nahum chapter 1, we'll see how, God, how Nahum starts. He starts really with a psalm. And so Nahum chapter 1, verse 2 onwards, we read this. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, the flower of Lebanon wilts, the mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of his place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns, and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. From you comes one forth who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counsellor. Thus says the Lord, Though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods I will cut off the carved image and the moulded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. And so uh, Nahum, as we've said, uh, starts his message with a psalm of worship. And that's interesting, isn't it? You know, bearing in mind the context that we've uh, um, sort of been at pains to, to paint, uh, he starts off by declaring God's power, declaring the majesty and mightiness uh, of God. Now, some hold chapter 1 uh, to be, again, a kind of a court picture. And I'm not absolutely convinced about this, but what you do see in here is there seems to be two sets of conversation going on. <coughs> one is the kind of the wrath of God poured out on Nineveh, but there is comfort spoken to Judah. And it's only probably only the logical way you can understand the passage is by um, looking at it in that way. Well, I wouldn't sort of like insist on it, um, but it may well be a useful device to unpack the chapter. So we have a look at the chapter. It's difficult to give it a title, but I've called it God's completeness of character. 
uh, because we have this contrast here. You know, God, uh, a lot of people um, that I've read uh, really don't like the book of, of Nahum, you know, because they see in there this angry God. Um, but we need to understand that uh, God is love and God is merciful and God is full of grace. But God also has a side to him that we need to understand, and, and that is anger at sin. And, and we can't get away from that. And, and um, the language that Nahum uses is, is astounding uh, poetry. It's really vivid language that he uses. Uh, and what he is doing is he is describing to Nineveh, he's basically saying to Nineveh, you think you are so great, you think you are so immovable, but let me point you to God who is far, far above all that you could ever be. And if you were to sit down and... and given the task but I want you to write a psalm or a song or a hymn about God about God's character about what he's like what would your first words be I don't think mine would be what verse 2 is where Nathan's first thing is is God is jealous God is jealous now why would, why would he say something like that well Nahum is telling Nineveh that God is jealous because he's reminding them that they have hurt his people. And we know the well-used phrase, he that touches you, touches the apple of God's eye. And, and it literally means to poke God in the eye. Uh, and God is angry with those who hurt his people. Assyria have overstepped the mark. And God sent them to perform an act of judgment. He gave them a job to do. And they completely went over the top. They abused their position as judges. They became plunderers and murderers uh, and, and committed all sorts of vile uh, wickedness. Uh, they invaded Judas, we said. They blasphemed God. We know that Sennacherib's words fell on his own head. He went back home after 185,000 men were slain by the angel of the Lord outside the gates of Jerusalem. And then his uh, eldest son murdered him, uh, hoping to capture the throne. A power struggle ensued. Uh, and in fact, he was banished to exile. He never, he never got the throne. But Assyria should have taken notice then and there that you don't mess with Judah's God. Um, but the way that they had behaved, both at Lachish and other cities and at Jerusalem, sparked God to anger. And so it reminds us that it's a very simple principle all throughout the scriptures that those who set their stand against God, Psalm 2, will uh, fall by their own counsel at Psalm 5. Uh, and so we are talking about a consistent theme that runs through the scripture, that you cannot take on God and win. God is not a tyrant. He's not quick-tempered. He's not like we are. He is slow to anger and full of compassion. But his anger is real. It is a slow-burning fuse that one day will, uh, will blow, uh, to, to use a military term. Assyria thought they could disregard God. They thought that Judah and God and his word and his people were completely insignificant. But they were to learn that if they would not bend to God, then they would perish. So Nahum starts off by saying that God is jealous and God is just. But he then goes on to say that God is mighty and majestic. Look at the second half of uh, verse 3. Uh, the Lord will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the cl clouds of the dust, sorry, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon uh, wilts. And again, you can see the, the vivid language. Uh, that, that Nahum uses, you know, this, this great picture of God controlling the storm, the winds and the waves obey him. You know, I wonder if the disciples ever thought of Nahum's words when they're in the boat that time, where he stands up and says, peace be still. He rebukes them. It's exactly the same word. Jesus rebukes the storm and it stops like that. And I think it was the suddenness of the stopping which frightened the disciples just as much as the fierceness of the storm. It was quite clear that the Lord Jesus was saying, you remember those verses in Nahum where God calms the storm? Well, you've just seen it. It's a proof of who I am. And again, a lovely image that, that Nahum does, uh, this idea that the, the clouds, 
these vast things that we see in this guy, they're just the dust of his feet. Uh, and again, you've got this idea of God either riding in his chariot or running across the, the road uh, and the, the dust kind of comes up. Well, that's the clouds. That's how big God is. You see parts of God's word. Well, Israel knew that because they've seen it in Moses' time and Joshua's time. The rivers have run dry. Also not a thing unheard of, especially when Israel were in, in idolatry. The, uh, and then it talks about the Bashan and Carmel um, in, in verse in verse 4, Bashan and Carmel wither. Well, Bashan, uh, you've heard of the Oaks of Bashan. Uh, it was a fertile volcanic area of, of Israel uh, and uh, a land of oaks where you've got your oaks. So it's a kind of symbol of strength, a symbol of permanence. But he says it will wither. Carmel was a mountain range 15 miles long. That too will wither. These are the strongest parts of Israel. They're symbols of the great strength of, of the land and yet they will wither. The flower of Lebanon also uh, will uh, wilt and, and scholars again are divided with that uh, as to what that means some say Lebanon was actually a mountain a snow-capped mountain in Israel um, uh, and, and it's kind of referring to the foliage on there could be that or it could be uh, of course an allusion to the, the trees uh, the cedar trees of Lebanon which uh, of course Israel used to buy uh, for all their building projects and then in more sort of like vivid language, we have verse uh, 6. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. I mean, what a picture of God, kind of like getting up from his throne in anger and, and rage, and got like hurling rocks at the, uh, the Assyrian army uh, at the city of Nineveh. Uh, it, it's a real picture, isn't it? And yet, of course... Um, we, we know from the New Testament that, uh, that God is going to come back one day in anger. There will be a day of judgment. And, uh, uh, and God is angry with the wicked. But then in contrast, and this is why some people think this is a kind of a judgment oracle, um, and both Assyria and Judah are kind of standing before God, because then in verse 7 we have a complete change. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place and the darkness will pursue his enemies. <coughs> and so Nahum uh, has uh, his psalm. Uh, so an angry God is not all that God is. Uh, we have the balance. The Lord is good. He is safe. He's, a, he's the defender of his people, is what the word means. And he understands uh, all of his people and so uh, here is how Nahum starts his prophecy against this in seemingly impregnable city after the psalm he turns in verse 9 to address Assyria uh, directly and he, in rhetorical language he asks why they why they rebelled in verse 12 he says you know you think you're safe uh, he says though they are safe and likewise many yet in this manner they will be cut down but God has decreed this impregnable looking city, this fierce and warlike people are going to come to an end. And it's a very sinister way of saying it. I will dig your grave. You know, it's done. The sentence is done. It's as good as done. You know, right now you're all powerful or you think you are, but your grave is dug. You know, that's the sentence. It is done. But then again, going back to Judah, uh, of course, as you'll know, Nahum quotes Isaiah, written sort of 50, 60 years earlier. Isaiah 52, Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows. And so it's a bit of a light touch to Judah compared to some of the other of the Book of the Twelve where Judah gets a bit of a hammering from some of these. Nahum is actually very gentle with Judah. And I think the picture is here that as they're... they're, they're, they're throwing off the yoke of the oppressor or the would-be oppressor and there is comfort right now Judah are living in fear you can just imagine the the situation when Sennacherib's army of 200,000 men turns up outside the city of Jerusalem boasting about all they've done they know it they know it um, you know a lot of Jerusalem no doubt have run away from it into the into the safety of the city so it would have been a terrible time to live under this this threat <coughs> of this huge Assyrian empire but God says, it's okay, it's done. Uh, Nineveh are judged 
and it's as good as over. And then we go into chapter 2, and we'll try and do this a little bit quicker. Uh, the psalm now, and again, this is, if you're a literary scholar, Nahum is the book to read. There is so much imagery here, and different sorts of writing. And the psalm really kind of turns uh, a little bit uh, of, ironic, uh, of irony now. And Nahum kind of writes uh, with some irony here. Um, so we, we now address this massive fort of Nineveh, and Nahum really takes on the kind of role uh, of, of a sergeant major. He's pretending he's in charge of the army, barking out orders. He says, you know, in verse 1, Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify the power mightily. And you kind of get this, this picture of this kind of sergeant major type barking out orders and soldiers running hither and thither in an utter panic. And of course, that wasn't how Nineveh was. Nineveh was an orderly city with you know, squadrons and soldiers and training and equipment and everything. But Nahum is picturing it as a mad panic where everybody's running all over the place trying to sort things out. And then he changes from the role of the satirical sergeant major to a news reporter. And the detail is so graphic here that a lot of liberal scholars feel that he actually must have seen it um, you know, and, uh, and, and reports what he sees. But this is a prophecy. But it's very graphic. He says, the, uh, the, you know, he talks about the army marching through, trampling over uh, the vine branches. The shields of his mighty men uh, are made red. And so we have a situation here where Nahum is reporting on a war zone. The vines are ruined by the march of the army. The shields are bloodstained. The spears are glistening in the sun. The chariots are raging at each other as the battle hots up. You may well know that the, um, the wheels of chariots were usually fitted with blades. Uh, so that as they ran through, uh, not only would they try and break the other chariot, but they would also would try and cut the legs of the horses before they could get to them. And so we had this kind of mad scene of blood and noise uh, and, and, and bodies. Um, and, uh, and we've got, you know, torches, uh, and running like lightning and all the rest of it. And then he says, the rivers, uh, the gates of the rivers are open, the palace is dissolved. And again, this is a prophecy, but this is actually what happened. The rivers burst their banks and, and, and burst some of the wall down. Uh, and he says, uh, this has been decreed. It's an interesting uh, verse 7. It says, it is decreed. And the word it uses there is Hazab. Uh, now, tradition says that Hazab actually was the name of the queen of Nineveh. So if you've got an, an authorised version, verse 7 will say, Hazab will be led away captive. And it's... Uh, taken to be a reference uh, to the Queen of Nineveh. The newer versions say it is decreed, uh, which is the literal translation of what Hazab's name was. And so we have here this, this, uh, this um, uh, picture of the Queen and her retinue being led away captive, uh, we're told, beating uh, their breasts uh, in verse 7. And so he's stopped his news reporting. He goes back to satire uh, in, uh, in verse um, 8, it says, though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Hail, hail, they cry. No one turns back. But he's kind of saying, stop. Take the spoil of silver. Take the spoil of gold. There's no end of treasure. Wealth of every desirable price. But now she's empty, desolate and waste. And so after this mad battle, uh, there is so much gold and treasure in the city, it's too much to carry away. And then he goes on with this picture of the lions in verse uh, 11. Where is the dwelling of the lion and the feeding place of the young lions? And he pictures there the lion walking through and taking the prey that he wants and filling his den with meat so that his cubs and his lionesses have got enough. And uh, Nineveh um, had more than enough to eat. And it's a kind of picture again of the plunder uh, that happened to the city uh, of Nineveh. But at the end of it, in chapter 2, verse 13, we have this very personalised statement. Uh, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots of smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers or ambassadors will be heard no more. And so Nahum is depicted, uh, the kind of the graphic scene 
uh, of um, the battle which ended uh, the, the city of Nineveh as the capital uh, of Assyria. And again, we need to remember that all of this was written when Nineveh was at the height of its power. And then in chapter 3, we have uh, the end of Nineveh. Uh, and in many ways, it's a continuation of chapter 2. But the difference in chapter 3 is a difference of tone. Mainly now, Nahum uh, sticks to being a prophet. And he starts off uh, using the word woe. Well, we've seen that more than once. It's what we call a woe oracle. It's a lament. And any sense that Nahum is glorifying in as some uh, commentators have, have rather strangely written that they kind of picture Nahum as this sort of like figure almost dancing about in glee you know that the enemies of Judah are, are squashed and that, that's not bad at all this is a woe, this is a burden this is a heavy message this is a terrible message and yet he has to write it so Nahum is not gloating in triumph over the fall of Assyria he recognises that this is a terrible day why is it a terrible day? Well, because we know that it's a fearful thing, isn't it? To fall into the hands of the living God. Why? Well, because Hebrews tells us our God is a consuming fire. You know, if you're going to die unrepentant, then you are going to the fate that is the worst fate that can ever be imagined. Far worse than anything Assyria could ever do to you. And they were pretty awful. But to fall into the hands of the living God is to have judgment without remedy isn't it and so as he goes through in this last chapter again we have the vivid language of battle coming back uh, you know woe to the bloody city it is all full of lies and robbery its victim never departs the noise of a whip the noise of rattling wheels of galloping horses clattering chariots horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear there's a multitude of slain a great number of bodies countless corpses they stumble over the corpses yeah, it's horrendous isn't it you know, we have this kind of idea from a film that, that, that war is a glamorous thing. It's not a glamorous thing. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And you can't imagine the sound of, of whips hissing through the air and the squeal of the horses, the cries of the injured and the dying, the sight of dead bodies, uh, of valiant soldiers lying in heaps on top of each other, mangled by chariots driving over them. That's the scene that, that, that Nahum is picturing to this very secure city and then he changes tack again in verse 4 and and it's almost answering the question why if 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 Nineveh were to read this book and and, and look at Nahum <coughs> why is God doing this and he gives a reason without the question being asked he says the reason is uh, that you're having such a severity of judgment it's because of how you've behaved because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot the mysteries of sorceries who sells nations through her harlots uh, and families through her sorceries. There is both the immoral angle and the idolatrous angle. And of course, as you probably know, the, this was all mixed together in the idol worship of the days. You've practiced, he says, shameful acts. You're going to be embarrassed. In verse 5, I will lift your skirts over your face and show the, naked, the nations your nakedness. Again, it's a picture of utter embarrassment, isn't it? Utter shame that someone would kind of lift up our clothes and show uh, what's underneath to all the world. Uh, and, and, and again, he goes back in verse 9, ju just in case you're thinking, no, we're okay, <laughs> we're Nineveh, you know, we've got this eight-mile wide, uh, eight-mile round city, hundred feet high, mm. you know, three chariots, width wide. we're safe, don't you worry about us. Mayhem reminds them, just remember Noamon. Noamon is the city of the the king or the worship rather uh, of Ammon it was a dedic city dedicated to the worship of Ammon uh, the Egyptian god equivalent to Jupiter the kind of chief of the gods and we know it more secularly as Thebes uh, and itself was a kind of city that was um, a bit of a, a pawn really in the war uh, between the Cushites and the Egyptians um, and it seemed that, that whoever kind of ran it, it's a bit like our civil service I think, it seems whoever ran it, the people who kind of were working there just carried on whoever's masters they were serving, they just carried on and serving them, there didn't seem to be any massive change, they haven't found any archaeological evidence of destruction, it just seems that the army walked in, took the loot and walked off again, 
Uh, and then once they sort of sorted it all out, they carried on afterwards. But nonetheless, to defeat this city was a major coup, and this is what they had done. Uh, are you better than that Noamon that was situated by the river? They had the waters around her. That's all the tributaries of the Nile in Egypt, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Uh, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength or her allies. Uh, Put and Libyan were your helpers uh, or um, your vassals, if you like. But she was carried away into captivity. And so they, they're reminding, you know, he's reminding of something that's only fairly recently happened. All right. Just as, you know, you thought that, you know, everybody thought that was impregnable. Well, it's going to happen to you. And we're back to Obadiah, really, aren't we? As it was done to them, so it will be done uh, to you. And then Nahum goes back one more time to satire, uh, where he says, um, he's already told them that, that you're going to be like drunk men and you will hide, you'll seek refuge and so on. But then he goes back to satire in verse 12 of chapter 3. Uh, All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they will fall into the mouth of the eater. Surely your people in, the, in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. And then he goes back to Sergeant Major ranting again. Draw water for your siege. Fortify your strongholds. Oh, go into the clay. Tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. And so on. And so he's saying, you know, what's gonna, what's gonna, what it's going to be like on that day. You, you think you're so inconquerable. You think you're so invincible. But actually... One shake of the tree and all the ripened figs come off. That's how vulnerable you are. That's how unstable you are. Uh, you know, the men, your tough guys, oh, well, they're like women. The enemies are going to pour in. The fire is going to burn up Nineveh. And then he says, you know, get the siege ready. Store your water up. You know, get uh, your brick and mortar to strengthen the walls. But he says, it's going to do no good. It's going to do no good. Make it, it will eat you up, he says in verse 15, like the locusts. You are going to be devoured. And your merchants and your generals, they're just going to vanish. The, the people who have sorted out your money and made you rich, the army that's protected you and kept you safe, they're going to disappear. And you're not going to see them um, anymore. Uh, your commanders are like the swarming locusts and your generals like the great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they are is not known. And so the book uh, then comes to this, this end, uh, where basically he says all of, the, all of the people who were supposed to look after you, your shepherds, your kings, they are all going to rest in the dust. They are all going uh, to die. And you'll notice that uh, the book ends with a question. Uh, can you think of any other book of the twelve that we've looked at so far that ends with a question? Jonah. Jonah. All right. Also sent to the Ninevites. And I think that's yet another literary device uh, to link the two messages. So you have Jonah, which says, those who repent will receive mercy. And Nahum says, those who don't will receive their doom. And so reads, very quickly, the book of Nahum. Um, but it's all God's word, and I don't know if you've, as we've whistled through it tonight, uh, you know, especially with the language and the vivid imagery and the kind of graphic descriptions of war and all of that, we might say, well, what do we learn from Nahum? You know, if I'm going to read this book myself, what can I hope to learn from it? And there are just a few things quickly that I think that it's good to emphasise. First of all, and, and you probably think this is Gary's hobby horse, but I think it's very important to say that the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament. And you may well have read this or heard this. Uh, scholars basically look at a book like Nahum and go, you know, God can't be like this. But you see, God is like this. And to say that he's not like this is a serious mistake. To say that, you know, once John the Baptist announced the Lord Jesus had come, that it was all different now, is, is misleading. Yes, it's different in the sense that Jesus has come to fulfill, but fulfill what? Fulfill the Old Testament. Fulfill what's already been written. And, and if the judgment of God was not as real as Nahum graphically depicts it, then Jesus didn't need to come, did he? But the whole point of Jesus coming is to take on the judgment of God in himself. 
And so Nahum reminds us, when we couple that with the New Testament, that God is the same. And God is, uh, or a part of God's character, or a part of the outworking of God's character, is his wrath. His wrath is real. And the wrath that is depicted so graphically in the Old Testament is still depicted in the New in exactly the same way. Revelation, of course, uh, although it's full of apocryphal language, is very clear that the wrath of God is something that will not uh, be quenched. Secondly, the book reminds us that uh, of the certainty that the judge of all the earth will do right. The, there is a day of judgment to come. Uh, and when we, we have this picture of what judgment is like for Nineveh in these kind of graphic military terms, but there will be a judgment for all. And we need again to live in the light of that judgment. We need to witness and preach to others in that judgment. It gives us a sense of urgency when we are witnessing to other people, doesn't it? That you know, if you carry on re, you know, re, re, refusing God, if you carry on jeering at God and ignoring at God, laughing at God, if you carry on hurting God's people, then there is a fearful judgment uh, for you to face. And whatever Nineveh's judgment faced, it will be nothing compared to the judgment that God will inflict because God's judgment lasts uh, forever. You know, hell and Hades and all of that lot, they're all thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. But that lake of fire doesn't go out. And so it is a terrible thing that people are facing. And sometimes it's not nice to talk about it. It's not nice to think about it. But sometimes we need to remember that God's anger and God's judgment are going to happen to the non-Christian. And it's something that is so awful that we must uh, take the gospel to them. The language of chapter 2 verse 13 is very personal. And it's really quite reminiscent i think of how the lord jesus speaks in revelation 2 and 3 to the churches you know when he says behold i'm against you mm. and actually sometimes jesus in the churches says i have this against you it's the same language and so we need to be very very clear that we are living uh, in <coughs> obedience uh, to god and so nahum reminds us also of the, the power and the majesty of god you know, this particular in this image of the stilling of the storm, which Jesus actually acted out, it reminds us, doesn't it, that uh, he is uh, all uh, powerful. But we also know that Nahum reminds us that God is good and kind and a defensive shield. There is a balance even in this rather fierce little book. And as we said already, Judah, for all their faults, are not rebuked here um, because they are walking in God's ways. And while we are walking in God's ways, we can expect. God to bless us. Uh, fourthly, Nahum was a prophet of God. And what that means is that all God said would happen, did happen. Even though Nahum writes at a time where Nineveh is at its most secure, at the height of its power, it was only uh, 40 or 50 years that it was nothing more than a heap of ruins uh, submerged in water and in dust. And so we need to remember that God's word always comes true. All of God's word always comes true. And we can trust that. You know, when we sometimes rather glibly say, well, you know, you've got to trust God in the storm. You know, well, Nahum reminds us we really can trust God in the storm. Uh, it's a proof of that. What God says will come true, will come true. And I think lastly, uh, this book leads us to worship, doesn't it? That we come to worship this God, this God who is full of greatness and majesty uh, and purity. You know, if you do go home and read some of Nahum again, perhaps go back and look at the psalm at the beginning. This, the language that it uses to describe God. God is not a small God. God is not to be trifled with. We live in a society, we live in an age where God is mocked and laughed at and blasphemed every day. But God is not a small God. Christmas shows a baby in a manger. But you'll notice that the narrative of the Gospels doesn't stay very long there, does it? It's relatively short because Jesus came fully God, fully man, to assuage the wrath of God against sin. Bring us back to him. So as we close this book, let's worship in awe and reverence and humility 
uh, and wonder this incredible God is our God if we put our trust in him. Amen. Amen.